This podcast is supported by Siemens, your partner for industrial grade AI. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of our industrial AI podcast. My name is Robert Weber, and it's a pleasure to talk to. Peter Seberg. Hello, Robert. Good afternoon, morning, uh, evening, evening, <laughs> night, wherever you are, dear listener. Peter, let's look back at the Siemens AI's with Purpose Summit before the main part. We spent two days in Munich, right. set up our studio, and met a lot of listeners there uh, yeah so what was your highlight well that maybe that was the, <laughs> that the, was the highlight maybe <laughs> well to be very honest and and you and we are so modest but then it's uh, it's it's so nice that that you come in there and you see all these people and some of them many of them we know of course and we do recognize them by face but then many of them recognize us by our voices, right? Yes. You say, "Oh, yes. oh, yes, you're the exactly. you're the person from you're Peter, you're Robert from Industry AI Podcast." Now, that's only a very small personal highlight. What was the highlight? I think the highlight was, to be honest, and of course, we need to have like this um, Chinese wall between. We're just reporting on what we were doing there. It, it was an amazing yeah. event. I think it was it was a huge event. It was about. It was all about industrial yeah. grade uh, AI. There were some specific highlights that we can that we can talk about. Of course, in in the first day, the afternoon, we had to talk by Johannes Brandstedt and uh, Albert Ortek, NXAI. We're we're probably going to talk about that one. Uh, you and I, we both moderated the use case session. We can talk about those as well. Exactly. But I would say it was the, the the overall event. It was was a huge event, a beautiful environment um you know close to munich uh, east um yeah it was it was a great happening so i have two okay. i have two favorites uh um my first favorite was a presentation by rocket science on an acoustics and ai in waste management that was very interesting and i then i said to you <laughs> peter you should record an episode <laughs> would you would you like to to share two ideas or two sentences about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, most certainly. So with Katrin Hursley, right, yes. Rocket Science, uh, I, I had a quick look this morning on their website, but only a very quick. The, yep. the first thing they say is we do not do Rocket Science. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I think it's a great name for yeah. a company I yeah. have to say we, that's not what we do, but now we have you and now we're going to tell you what we do. So do, they do uh, things, let's say things related to acoustics, sound, and and she was there together with uh, Max uh, Schönstein. He's from Martin GmbH Umwelt Technik, yes. and they talked about com uh, contamination detection with acoustics and AI, and that's exactly and that's what we talked about in the podcast. Very interesting. I think the base idea is, let's say, you know, there's these huge installations where you know, all kind of uh, stuff that we throw away goes in uh, after, of course, we have uh, gathered yeah. the things that we can reuse, glass and paper and stuff, whatever is left goes in there. And at a certain point in time, I believe there's a heat exchanger and it, it, it becomes dirty and needs to be cleaned. And very interesting. I would have never thought that, you know, let's consider what, what sounds can do for us. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, they still have to share the sounds with me, I believe. So if yep. you're listening, uh, Max, Max, you told me you're going to share the original wave sources. Yep. And then and then you hear the waves falling down. You can yep. hear the waves falling down. And then you think, oh, what are you going to do with that? Now, what they're going to do with that is that the AI model is going to interpret you know, you're going to first, you're going to tag the sounds and the humans are going to say, okay, this is now this and that is that. And then they know the exactly the amount of energy actually that has been coming down or in, I don't know in detail, you will, you will probably yeah. hear that later on. Very interesting. All episodes we record will be published in the next few weeks, but I have one more question. Do they convert the sound file into an image and then compare the images or is it really sound based that's a good question that i did not ask i'm not sure if it's necessary i think i understand what you mean yeah 
um, that you can see the waves, you know? Yeah, I'm perfectly with you. Yeah. You know, in the book that I wrote a couple of years back, and on the cover there's the the bird, you yep. know, and it's recognizing a bird. It's exactly the same. Let's say, let's let me be who's not the professional say yep. that it's the same principle. And at that time, I looked at how that is being done. And of course, you get a wave. Of course, you get a wave of your voice, of my voice. Exactly. Now, is that is uh, that's a good question. I don't know. If, uh, Catherine, if you're listening, yep. feel free to send Robert or Peter an email explaining if you go through, you know, looking at the image of the wave and then know exactly what's happening, or if there's another way that actually the model directly recognizes, you know, what's what's going on. Good question. Yeah, I can answer. We will add that to the episode then. Yep. And uh, my second favorite was uh, the presentation by Rainer Brehm. He uh -huh. explained how Siemens developed the industrial co-pilot for engineering and made it robust. And then there was another piece of news because the industrial co-pilot for engineering will be available for free in summer. That's right. interesting. And they're partnering with Microsoft, he said, for sure. And then he said, oh, last summer, after the presentation at Hannover Messe, Microsoft changed the model. And they were crazy because, okay, now we, we, we started to make it robust and then they changed the model and mm -hmm. they have to start again. And it's, yeah, it's very interesting. I'm really looking forward to the episode with Reiner because it, it's, it's described with a lot of details how you build now a product out of a AI model for an industrial yeah. uh, operation together with Scheffler. We had an episode, but yeah. it was more yeah. POC and now it's getting live. But that's interesting, yeah. Now, you're still going to do the recording with yeah. Rainer, right? Yeah, so I do the make recording. make sure that you're going to ask him what was their considerations regarding, you know, are we going to ask money for it or yeah. what? what is the deal? What is the deal? And we had that discussion. I had the discussion with, uh, with Trump as well, right? You know, yeah. are we going to... No, okay, we're going to take the data. And that, uh, in case of Trump, it was a, you know, it was an exchange of data. You recall, I mean, it was your... You know, five years ago, you said, you know, I'm going to get a free coffee if I give my data. Yeah. You no, know, the question is, is that the initial deal they're going to do? You know, we're uh -huh. at the beginning, we're going to take the data on a kind of a contract. I don't know. And the data is the currency until maybe at some point in time, that's going to be different. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was very good. It was so good uh, because it was so honest. Yeah. It was so honest. This was not a... A typical uh, corporate presentation, you know, we are the greatest, we're the best. Yeah. Anyway, of course, that's what they want to convey, and that's perfectly okay. But it was a very honest um, showing, what, I think, three years, maybe, three yeah, years three after years. day. Yeah. And showing, yeah, this is this is not this is new for us as well, yeah. and we're going to be very open with you. And they were showing the the glimpse they had at Hanover Mass when our chancellor was supposed to be talking to the robot. It didn't happen. That was that was a very very refreshing. That he was very open and honest with, and said, you know, yeah, that was a mistake that we did. You know, I think the chancellor was supposed to first say hello, robot, or yeah. something like that. Right? Hello, AI. Hello, AI. <laughs> that was forgotten. Yeah. So but that was just a, that was a reference point to him being very honest and open. We're only humans. We are very good, but you know, we have to learn as well and together with you. And that was very uh, very refreshing. What else have you got? Well, I have two other ones, yeah. right? I believe that uh, in the in the range of uh, you and I moderating the use cases, in total there were about 20, I guess, right? But the yeah. very first one on the first day was uh, Christian Gelcher, Embraceable mm -hmm. AI. I'd never heard of him. And he's, he was together with uh, Chadi Serhan from Merkle. And they talked about quality assurance for simulation reports, Gen AI. And the, the real interesting thing, which is the big topic for me, kind of, that I've now been following for a couple of weeks, months maybe, is that, you know, they use agents to bring hallucinations down to close to zero you know that was really and i actually i shared one specific approach of combining llms with knowledge graphs this mm -hmm. morning again mm -hmm. uh and i see i see maybe like two three four of them now every day so this is a huge very important topic and uh, embraceable ai seemed to be like further 
already in what they had been doing until now, mm -hmm. then some of the solutions I see today. So very interesting. Uh, and then, of course, there was Andreas Kreiner. He is oh. uh, with uh, Pira, Pira Innovation. Pira is also the company behind uh, Annex AI, which maybe we'll talk about in another minute in a sec. Yeah. Um, LS, XLSTM, Annex AI. And we did two presentations. Uh, and the one that I did, you did one with them as well, was building sales warranty dashboards on the fly. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. And interestingly, that again is on the same topic. And I think you're going to pick that up when you're going to mix the, the podcasts uh, together. But uh, the, the core of what, again, he did a very similar thing to Rainer. He was taking us listeners by the hand and says, we're in a proof of concept. We're in the very middle of it. Yep. And there is this company and they have, you know, they said, you know, give us all your... Uh, the data, whatever data you have, and we have an AI that is going to automatically produce your knowledge graph as the basis. And that, to me, is kind of, oh, is that possible? <laughs> I yes. didn't know that that is possible. And I keep it, I, I, I keep the question in the air like that. Is that really possible? And he's open to it as well. He says, is that really possible? But what they have seen so far is very interesting. Um, very promising, right? Yeah, but just because I always thought that what I've been reading from the professionals on the topic of the knowledge graphs and you have to manage your data, you cannot, I mean, the old saying, give me all your data mm -hmm. and I can, that is a 10-year-old saying that until now has never really uh, established itself. And the saying that I have by reading more and talking to people is always like, you have to put effort into and the and the example i want to share is is the same with opc ua and many of you know as an as an communication architecture you have to put effort and time into and if you do that then you're going to earn the results exactly. later on but you yeah. have to so so it's very interesting let's see let's stay close to what uh, andreas learns there and i do, did ask him you know because they're in the very middle of it so if they're going to hear the next steps in the next couple of days, they will they will share with us if it is possible that an AI can for you actually organize the knowledge graph. And next AI, you have seen the presentation. What's your opinion? Uh, yeah, it was very. Uh, oh, this could have could have gone on for an hour. I did. I did a lot these of mornings, right? They had a normal shot like everybody else, mm -hmm. 30 minutes. And it was, um, of course, the room was completely packed. I, I think they could have done it on the on the main stage. Yeah. But, you know, you never know before. It was amazing. Johannes, as the professor, assistant professor for the moment, I believe, yep. but as yep. the scientist, and it was so nice. You could, you could feel the same way that we have had you know, Zeb Hochreiter, mm -hmm. whenever we had him, we could feel the tension. Mm -hmm. And and he is exactly the same way he says. He was talking about the big moments of the last uh, 10, 20 years in AI, you know, the 2012, was that NIST, was it 2017 mm -hmm. Transformer? He was, and he was telling, he was sharing his own experiences And he is clearly suggesting this is the same <laughs> how with uh, XLSTM, it's going to change the world again. That was on one hand, Johannes, and together with Albert Ortig, a very fine, a very balanced managing director of Annex AI, who's then answering more the questions on, you know, what is the role of AI act and stuff like that. So one I've actually forgotten, if we can also yep. do that quickly. Yep. Uh, we've heard about a couple of times, Anna-Marie Schlinkert, Katulu. Yeah. We've had her together with Eric Schwulera from Siemens. You know, we've heard about what Katulu does. Yeah, federated learning. It's yeah. the federated learning, right? When I had them in the track, I thought, okay, well, let's see. But yes, I did hear a couple of new things, and they were, uh, for me, they were more in the area of 
let's say more uh, solving also potentially globally political problems because now they work together mm -hmm. and the Katolu platform is there for the Siemens with regards to the electronics, you know, PCB, PCB. manufacturing yep. around the world. Mm -hmm. And then Eric gave the example of, you know, uh, you, you are not allowed to bring data out of China, yep. but now comes in federated learning. You can export you know, model parameters, which is what you do, right? Yep. You know, for those of you listeners who are not aware of the federated learning, you don't bring the data to your uh, algorithms centrally, typically in a, you know, big cloud. No, your, your algorithms, they come to the data, you extract the parameters, and then you, you build your model. And also in relation to even what I that was new to me, the Data mm -hmm. Act. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to be kind mm -hmm. of aware of what it is that you're allowed to do, even within Europe. Yep. You and I should make a podcast on that, Robert, yep. because I think we need to be, I wasn't aware at all. And he said, oh, no, you also need to be careful with transferring industrial data. I don't know the details. I try to make myself a bit, little bit knowledgeable, but I think that's going to take another uh, podcast sometime. Exactly, exactly. So, Let's listen to the host for a moment. I spoke to, to Boris Scharinger from Siemens. What is his opinion on the AI with Purpose Summit? So I recorded, I think, two or three minutes. Let's listen. But I can tell that I heard a lot of good things about the intrinsic presentation on uh, the future of foundation models for robotics. And I heard many, many great things about the update that was given by our and XAI colleagues from, from Linz, right? Okay, that's research, right? Yeah. Let's talk about a use case that inspired you because we had a own session about use cases and we in the Industry AI podcast always talk about, you, we talk about research, about academia, but we want to talk about use cases to learn something from use cases. What was the most interesting use case you saw? For example, Safran Analytics presented how they approach AI-based testing in the production. Mm -hmm. And what I found pretty amazing is how st statistically driven they were trying to frame what can ever be the prediction quality mm -hmm. of the solution that we build, right? And they had a very analytical approach and said, given the data points that we have, given the, the size of the data sets, given the features, we will not make it above a certain ceiling of prediction quality. Mm -hmm. And this tells me that there is a fundamental passion and drive, not fancy, mm -hmm. right? They, they were telling us how far they could go and where they struggle uh, to, to kind of break through that performance, model mm -hmm. performance ceiling. And that is very decent, that is very grounded, that is very analytical. And this is exactly from my perspective what we need to mature AI than to become industrial grade. So I found that fascinating as an element of uh, perfection and ambition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Let's have a quick outlook next year. What is your plan? Well, first of all, the plan is to do it again. Okay. <laughs> and uh, of course, we are collecting a lot of feedback. We understand what we can improve a bit. And we are now in discussions internally and probably need a couple of more weeks for that. Do we scale further, right? When we started... Yeah, with sure, your scaling is... <laughs> it's all about scaling. When, when we started 2022 with the first instance of this conference, we started with, was it 160 people uh, or a bit more? Yeah. Participants. Participants. And then we doubled in 23 and now we more than doubled, right? Wow. So scaling... The event is a goal and maybe also scale AI solution is the next step for, for the industrial. Mm -hmm. We are very excited what happens next and we are looking forward to the next year. Um, Peter, let's move to the main part because I recorded an episode with Shah Khan from Bar Technologies. I have never heard this company, but it's a mm -hmm. company in, based in UK and he's the lead of R&D. They are in this ship designing business. And you said, okay, ship designing, pff, that's not interesting. But it's very well. interesting because <laughs> Shah shares how they generate data for new designs with Gen AI. And this should also 
be of interest to our mechanical engineering company because it's synthetic data and it's real data, but they they had not enough real data and mm -hmm. then they they uh, generate data. Very interesting. It's ship design. It's a totally different branch, but very very interesting. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I haven't heard. I'm looking forward to. Yep. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, that's the approach I will have as a you know a studied architect. The same, yep. you know, the architect. I guess globally, if I may be so modest, <laughs> probably was the first two thousand years ago to de to to bring a model. Right. It's it's always about. A modeling simulation is always looking into the future, right? Yeah. It's it's like you yourself as a person who wants to, to do so. Sure, all of us who have the capability say, I want to do, I want to build something, I want to build a house. And those of us that are more creative, they have their own ideas. Those mm -hmm. of us who have not, since 2,000 years, they go to an architect and he or she has the capability to 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 get a look into the future now if it's now about a new machine if it's about a plan if it's mm -hmm. about a ship a, a complete production line or the ship i can very well imagine that what we're going to hear in the main session is but it's be so funny because all of us. he said ship design didn't change over the last 30 years a <laughs> tanker is a tanker and still they have <laughs> the same design and now they are oh, capable my. to design new ships so it's very interesting right. yep. okay so we're so we're back now to hanover massa three years ago yep. five four years ago where we had uh, at festo stand yep. Jan and we had, uh Jan, yeah yep. <laughs> Jan said you know in a couple of years you know the and and we then talk reinforcement learning but the idea is always the same doesn't matter if we call it reinforcement learning or whatever the algorithmic approach is let's put it like that yep. you know soon the algorithm's gonna help or gonna gonna design them for us or and that's what i assume and i'm looking forward to are going to show us many different options and we can choose from them right thank you peter it was a pleasure Robert, thank you very much. Have a good day. Uh, going back to our more normal work and dear listener, uh, hope to have you with us soon again. Bye-bye. Bye. And my guest today is Shah Khan from London, and we talk about the design of ships and how AI and Gen AI are changing it. But before we start, why don't you briefly introduce yourself, you and your company, Shah? Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Charles. I'm an R&D lead at Bar Technologies, which is a simulation-driven maritime innovation company. Mm -hmm. We work on developing various energy-saving devices, which help to reduce fuel consumption, thereby CO2 emissions in shipping. And one of our leading product is Wind Wings, which is a wind-assisted propulsion system. That system helps to reduce fuel consumption around 1.5 ton per day, uh, that replicates towards approximately five tons of CO2 savings. But before we really get going, we are not talking about a product today, but about a look into the near future about corporate research, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And we want to talk about ship design. I don't know the industry. I don't know the challenges. Tell us how does the industry work? What is so special? And What are the problems maybe or the yeah the homework this branch has to do? Absolutely. Robert, would you like me to give up? Because I have a story myself that how I went into this field, like how okay. I face the challenge, how yeah. I get into it. So by training, to be honest, I'm a mechanical design engineer. I went on becoming a yacht designer. That was the first time where that's back in 2016 when I start looking like how machine learning could be adopted towards better designing yachts more efficiently. Mm -hmm. And then I went on doing a PhD in marine engineering. That the entire process or my career development was really driven by the problem that I first saw. Like maritime industry is seems to be or considered to be a bit of conservative industry. We don't have a, the, the pace that is followed by automotive and in aeronautics. But We all when it know, comes like, to design, when it comes to new models or new designs, right? Exactly. But as the new regulations are coming into place for reducing CO2 emissions around the globe, 
And we all know that water transport is responsible for approximately 90% of global trade. Mm -hmm. And in 2020, global shipping itself emitted approximately 1.4 billion tons of CO2. Can you imagine such a big scale? Yeah, yeah. And within yeah. that accounts towards 3% of CO2 emissions globally. So to tackle that international maritime organization, which is a part of a bigger organization, they have placed various metrics and regulations for the shipping companies to reduce these emissions. So their target is by 2030 to reduce these emissions by 40%. 40%? So it's, wow. Yes. Whoa. It's, it's a big challenge, <laughs> but I think we have a roadmap now that we can achieve that or we can closely achieve these goals. But so far, the trend has been that how these aims will be materialized, that as I said, like similar to my company, Bar Technologies, we're developing energy saving devices. So this is a very specific term that we use in maritime industry. So energy saving devices are those devices that we can retrofit on the existing vessels to reduce fuel consumptions, thereby reducing the CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. So these methods or these technologies have worked very well. Yep. But yep. In, in the industry, we know that 90% of the overall project cost is accounted by the decisions that are made at the early design stage. Okay, mm -hmm. And through the studies, it has been also realized that 90% of the performance efficiency can be achieved really at the design stage. Mm -hmm. And however, even with such reductions that can be achieved at the design stage, we don't have tools, right? Set of tools to design effective ships or effective vessels. Why are there no tools? Because as I said, like the shipping industry has so been conservative. still okay. bit, bit of a conservative look. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, the designs that you will see, which were like 100 years ago, yes. and the yeah. designs that are today, they still have a strong correlation between them. Absolutely. Yeah. They are not significantly deviating. Well, that approach, let me tell you like how a typical ship design process starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you are a ship design office. A customer comes to you with set of design requirements that I want a vessel which has A set of requirements, B set of requirements, C set of requirements. You will go towards your existing database. You will take a baseline design. You will update that design through a iterative process to match these new requirements. And until you set approach a satisfactory design. So everything starts with the baseline design. And all those baseline designs were developed in the past with this conservative or narrow design spaces. So you don't have a freedom to really explore aggressively different designs. Mm -hmm. That was the problem that I came. And then I started to explore, like, are there existing tools to actually help this diverse design exploration towards designing more efficient ships? The question was, no, there are not that such tool. And the problem came back in 2015 when there was a first paper by Aon Goodfellow on generative model, who I would say who reintroduced this approach for creating realistic images of the people that doesn't exist. It was 2015 you mentioned, right? Yes, that was okay. the paper I remember. I read that. But you, you talked about machine learning and you have been working on the topic for some time. And then you realized, oh, there's a gen AI approach. Or Please explain. Yes, yep. exactly. Okay. So the problem was machine learning has been used a lot in the industry back in, let's say, 2000s. But that was mostly the in engineering, the efforts were centered around how you can predict the performance, yeah. which has worked very well. So, for example, previously, you would have to, to run large amount of CFD simulations, which are computationally expensive, time consuming. And then you will bypass this simulation process by building surrogate models using machine learning or other statistical approaches. But in this case, the problem wasn't predicting the performance because you can only predict the performance if you have the design, mm -hmm. right? Yep. If you don't even have the design, how can you predict the performance? And the designs that you existingly have, they are almost similar to each other. There is not a margin for creating widely diverse shapes. So how can you do that? How can you create design spaces which are extensively vast, can able to create multi-purpose, special purpose vessels, and simultaneously they are very efficient in terms of their fuel consumption and their emissions. Mm -hmm. right? So that really drove the efforts that how we can create these tools. 
-hmm. And then that I was, was 2015, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. And that was the time that I felt like, okay, there is a nice gap and I would really like to get into this field and try to see how we can overcome these gaps. Mm -hmm. And then I went, actually, I did not start right away on that problem. I started my PhD in 2020 and as a Mercury Fellow and the team, the research team I joined, they also had a similar problem. So whenever they would have to design a muscle, they will go select a design, they will parameterize a design. The standard take, design. Yes, yeah. and then take this design and then re further refine this design until it achieves a given design specifications and the requirements. So every time there was a changes in, the new, in those requirements, we will have to repeat that process again. So you will have to reconstruct the design, parameterize it, evaluate it, and then reach to a design which satisfies the new requirements. So we wanted a tool that was generic, so it could able to design not only one type of vessel, that's like not only container ship, cargo vessel, or yachts or something, that tool was generic enough to create any type of vessel, mm -hmm. okay? And also able to create those multi-purpose and special build vessels okay. where the industry okay. struggles a lot. So for that, we need how we could do it. So that idea, as I said, like back in 2015, when I wrote the paper, first paper on generative adversarial network, I was like, okay, one second. With the right amount of data, if we can create images of people that doesn't exist, can we do the, the same? Can we use the design data of the ships and create a model which will be able to create the shapes which, quote-unquote, doesn't exist. And how do you give the design the requirements? That's a very good point. So the biggest challenge in constructing that model was first, how where do we get the data? We all know that they're as, they're, sure. the number of ships are not as many as the number of people on the planet, yeah. right? And second... The, the shipping industry is not that as open as automotive industry. You don't get the, the design data um, laying out over the web. Oh, that's a pity. <laughs> yes, that, that's very pity. So we had to spend almost two years in time of creating a data set that would be vast and diverse enough to create that generic generating model for ship design. Is it only scientific data or is it real data? Yes. Another point was, that's a good point. We tried to add the both type of data, both the real data and the scientific data. Data. So the scientific data, because there are certain designs that are validated by several research institutions like MARIN, Netherlands Maritime Research Institution, or Italian National Research Council's Institute of Marine Engineering. Those have validated these designs for experimental purposes. Mm -hmm. But most of them, most of the time, these designs also act as a basis or as a baseline design in the industry too. So we gathered that data and then we end up having approximately 17 different classes of designs. And we all know that 17 different data points are not enough to create a generic uh, generative model. Sure, sure. Um, so we had to come up with the approach like how we can further extend it. And then that was the point that we couldn't exceed more than these, these designs. We came up with an idea that we could create an augmented data or synthetic data by varying, by manually creating different variations of those 17 different designs. That represents 17 different classes, including naval vessels, oil tanker, cargo vessels, LNGs, yachts, offshore sport system vessels. And then because another problem that we came up that we couldn't, we cannot pass everything into the model because if we put something unrealistic into the model, the model will always able to create unrealistic design. So we had to develop some filters to make sure that always a good data is passed into these models. So the models are reliable in terms of creating designs and geometries and matching the, the requirements. Okay. okay. So these, we created two types of filters, like one was a performance filter, another was a validity filter. Validity filter was how we can validate these designs based on the geometry. So is the design has, for example, good geometric representation? Is it watertight? Is it not self-intersecting? And the second was 
what's the performance of design? Can we evaluate the performance of design or is it good enough for that? So by passing through these two filters, we came up with approximately 50,000 designs, variations. Wow. Okay. Okay. Sha, one question. So when we talk about design, we talk about simulation and stuff like that, and we are talking about moving parts. I think that's the most critical part, right? Because you can have data, but we, we talk about moving parts when we talk about cars or ships or machines or motors. Is this the most problem when generating synthetic data that we talk about moving parts? Yes. I mean, synthetic Another problem that, that relates to this question that you asked that these generative models have been used a lot in computer graphics community. So where the aim is to train the model to create variations of 3D objects. But in our case, by an engineering problem, the aim is not just creating the variations, exactly. but creating the models which are physically validated or exactly. viable. Yeah. Those have certain degree of feasibility. Because for example, if this generative model created a design which have a slight variation on the surface or less smoothness on the surface. So the physics for that or for those two models will be completely different, right? Because these models, these designs have to be operating into the real life conditions. Mm -hmm. right? So the problem, the aim is not just creating shape variations, but creating shape variations which are viable, feasible, and takes into account different operating and manufacturing constraints. And how good is your data set now? Right, that's another question. So once we pass through that model, we got this a reliable data set, right? The second thing is How do you measure is it reliable? What I said earlier, we, we introduced two performance filters. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, right. okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so one to check the, the validity of the shape. The second is to check what's the, the performance of the, that specific design. Yeah. Okay, so we took that, we removed bad performing design, we removed invalid designs or infeasible designs, and then we came up with this, and the exact number is 52,490 design. That's what when people ask me how you came up with this exact number, I tell them like that's where this exact number comes from after passing it through performance filters. Now, once we get the reliable data, and now we're going to train the model, right? But... As I said earlier, this is not a problem of a computer graphics community where the objective is to just to create synthetic variations or variations of an existing shapes, but we have to validate, we have to make the model somehow physics informed because these models, designs resulting from these models will be used in real life, mm -hmm. right? So how, we how do you do that? It's physics. Okay. So there is a lot of, there is a new type of models was introduced back in 2019 called physics informed models. Mm -hmm. So the aim here is that while you're training a machine learning model, you take a certain part of your physics, you add it into your loss function or objective function during the training. So the model learns a more of a compact representation of the physics also. Mm -hmm. And that's what the word comes about physics informed. So the model is physics informed. Although these models have been used widely, but in our case, we took a slightly different approach. We had a problem that, okay, we want to infuse physics. We could do it in that way, but there is, we came up with a slightly different way. And in our case, for that specific application worked very well. We developed geometric operators based on a ship drag and resistance, or in, in generic term, you can say performance theory that was introduced back in 1930s. And then with those that using that theory, we develop geometric operators. So these geometric operators, they act as a basis for evaluating the physics in case, in our case, drag as the ship moves through the water, but they're not computationally as expensive as evaluating the physics ex itself. For example, a high fidelity CFD simulation to evaluate the drag or resistance of a ship could easily take two to three days. And imagining doing that for 50,000 plus designs, that would take forever. So we developed these operators, which holds a lot of information about the physics, but they are computationally cheap to evaluate by 90% in terms of computational cost. Mm -hmm. We took those ones, those models, and took those operators, fit into our model, and then trained this, that model. And from our testing, we realized that this model we could use 
not only to optimize the existing type of designs, but also to create new type of designs. For example... Yeah, what I'm interested in is, now I'm the shipbuilder, and how do you give the design requirements then to the model? Do I have to write a, like a prompt or something, or what is the idea? So the idea here is that we have converted that model into a like a function, like a library. Okay, okay, okay. perfect. And it takes, it starts with two set of different parameters. The first parameter is the design constraint. How much volume that design should hold, what should be the overall depth, length, and the width of that design, and once you, which we call it bonding box. So once you define your bonding box based on your requirements, like for example, if you're designing a container ship, then you would say like how many containers that vessel approximately that vessel should able to hold. And then you, you define that number, And then based on other constraint that typically comes from customers, for example, if the vessel has to pass through a Panama Canal, then it has a certain limitation how much width or the breadth it can has, how much width it can has. So all this constraint, the model takes it. So these are the predefined constraints or the requirements the model takes it. And then within these constraints, the model, the user has two possibilities. So the user either says the model, okay, find me, N number of design which satisfy all these constraints, including the performance one. For example, the user wants performance to be between in this and this range. Mm -hmm. So the model will come up with various different designs satisfying all those design and performance constraints. Design means there's a visualization then? Yes. Okay. okay. So it, 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 these are actually like uh, 3D surfaces of the designs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then from there, user can select a one that best matches the requirement or matches all the requirement and then take the design as a baseline to further develop because there are several different constraints and the designs that are kept in mind throughout the development process. So that right now the tool has the ability to take into account certain set of constraints and requirements, but not at a very holistic level. This is something that would need further developments. Mm -hmm. And it does the model con continue to learn when the designer changes something? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, th so there are two venues for that. Either the designs that are coming out of the model, some of them can still be, let's say, infeasible from a side. For example, it could have like very sharp changing in the shape. Okay. So that from the manufacturability point of view, this could be not possible. You don't have to run detailed analysis to identify that where the an experienced designer can can directly tell you mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. okay? So this information can go back to the model and then the from that information model can run, okay, I understand that these type of designs are that this typical user is not interested in. So in the future exploration for that typical user, the model won't provide that design, but this have to be more into the as like the details of the model okay. where okay. the user would really need to understand like how to program it in a certain way that it won't give us these type of design in the future. Mm -hmm. When we talk about design, we talk about intellectual property also. How difficult is it now to manage intellectual property and a design, a design solution by a Gen AI approach? That's a very good, difficult, and I would say a like hard question to answer. Yeah, yeah. So right now, this tool was the outcome of my, my PhD. There has been several industrial partners, including my company, where I'm currently working on to see like where what these tools could, could give us. Right now, I think it's still at the development stage yeah. where a lot of different aspects of research are needs to be done and needs to be in place to have, let's say, a holistic level of maturity for such Gen AI tools in shipping. Yeah. But what do the shipbuilders say? Are they happy um, or...? As I said, like, for, for shipbuilders, it still needs some time to really have a look in terms of adoptability. Mm -hmm. They are interested in seeing, let's say, like, such designs can be possible. There is a, such a tool there, as I said. But... From the shipbuilder point of view, they are still hesitant in adopting such approaches because, as I said earlier, there's still need of a development there. Sometimes model will come up with a solution where 
it's different from performance point of view, it's performing well, but from manufacturing point of view, it may not be feasible to construct, right? Or it may be a bit expensive to, exp- uh, to build. So these type of constraints, those who are a bit more subjective and require, I would say, expert level details mm-hmm. would need to be extracted and put it into the model. We have actually a recent the project. It's funded by a UK research organization that will work into this aspect, like how we can incorporate in this model, like expert view on the designs. Mm-hmm. So the domain perspective, domain knowledge. Yes, exactly. The domain knowledge that has to be integrated into the into the model itself. So I mean, like the broader vision would be imagining a. Is something a similar system like uh, Gemini or ChatGPT, but really focused on designing ships. For example, user goes towards that. Okay, it says like, okay, I want to start designing a ship, which is a container vessel, which should have this much capacity, which should have this, this, this constraint. Systems come up with design. And then system pass it towards a surrogate model, which evaluates the performance of all those designs. And then system says, okay, you know what? Designing is one part and maintaining the regularity constraints and the operations another part. Then system takes from there towards the operational mm-hmm. part where how to analyze like what they that specific design, how it will perform if it was in a specific ship route, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. If that design, while it's voyaging on that specific ship route, does it satisfy the regularity requirements or not? And this type of system, which have like that, that type of holistic projection would be of great use. Yes, absolutely. As I said earlier, so this is just a phase where we wanted to see like, can Gen AI could be used to create designs which will be viable in the next 50 years or 100 years? Charles, it's very interesting because my question is now, what can other industry learn, especially when it comes to the development of your data set? I think that's really interesting. What is your opinion on that? I think we could, for industry itself, like they, for example, bigger industries, let's talk about automotive. and yeah, But they in, have a lot of data, right? They have a lot of data. As, as I said, like the variations, because to best create these models, you need to have a diverse data. Yeah. Diverse data so the model can able to, to generalize variations between the designs. And they already have a lot of data. I think the only thing is they have to understand like how this model works and how they can use the existing data in their organizations to train these models. I mean, the, I think most of the industries, when it comes to adopting machine learning, AI, or now Gen AI, is that they don't realize that they may have the data that they would need in terms of creating these models. Mm-hmm. So they don't have to work further on developing the data sets. Mm-hmm. But really like your approach to develop or to generate synthetic data. That was very interesting, I think. And that maybe is a blueprint for other industries. Or am I wrong? I think 100%. I think synthetic data, is it's not an approach that was only followed by us. But in speech recognition, in image training, in, in video decoding, there's a lot of cases where we have seen like the performance can be further in- increased, especially in the cases where the availability of the data is an issue, like in our case. So the creating synthetic data can really help. Yeah, but I think it's so important when we talk about industrial use cases and we talk about synthetic data, that is the totally different field, you know? When you talk about speech or, or language, It's also a different field because, as we mentioned before, we are talking about moving and we are talking about movements and we talk about moving parts in the simulation and at the end at the vessel or at the machine, right? Yes, exactly. As I said, like we are borrowing this tool from this community. Like in engineering, we're borrowing this tool, but now the trend has changed that we are instead of just borrowing this tool and using them as a black box. We are updating them to meet the requirements within the engineering, within the design. Mm-hmm. So, for example, one example I gave is physics in form model. Yep, yep, right? yep. So instead of training just on a very specific loss function, you actually integrate also some component of physics into that loss function. And we have seen the cases where sometimes 
model can predict or at least like help you predict or drive the performance without even needing some data because it's just relying on the laws of physics. So that's some interesting examples. And I think like in Gen I too, where the problem is not only to predict the performance, but actually to create design itself. Exactly. So these type of, let's say like integration would be also be essential, I would say, for creating some viable models. Sha, you already mentioned what are your next steps, but what will be on your desk tomorrow? To be honest, like I... I have holiday. I wish I had I'm enough vacation. time to, <laughs> to, to work on, on this model on further. But I think like in the future and my the team that I was part of uh, during my PhD, they are working currently on further enhancing and developing this model and trying to see, let's uh, try to also educate the industry first. Yeah, I think the, it has showed some progress. It has shown some potential, but I think roadmap towards industry, it still needs some some time and some motivation in adoptability by the industry. Mm -hmm. But your company is not pursuing the topic. My company is not currently pursuing the topic because we are in the process of developing something different. But the long-term future is that we're gonna combine look into it in adopting such approaches and the techniques okay. in over tool or device development. And what are your plans? Can you share it with us? For example, one thing from the generating modeling point of view, we are working on how we can expedite over existing design pipelines. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if an optimization process takes, for example, four months to complete from getting customer requirements towards providing them the final solution, how we can expedite this pipeline, this process through using machine learning, deep learning and Gen AI. Mm -hmm. Well, if I want to know more now, which person do I need to contact? Who's working on, on this model? Is it a special university? Is it a special research team? Who is working on that? You mentioned the funding from the UK government or something. Who is working on that model? Um, right now for that model, my professor, Dr. Panagiotis Kaklis from University of Strathclyde at the Department of Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering. It's one of the biggest marine engineering department, not only in UK, but in, in the Europe. Mm -hmm. They are currently working on that and they have right now a collaborative project between MIT, University of California, Berkeley, Imperial College, London, Marin, which is a leading maritime institu research institution in Europe. Yeah, I'm like, they are in the process of bringing different uh, industrial and academic and research institutions on board to further develop this model. Would you say that you have started to discuss marine design foundation model? What do you mean by design foundation? Would you say that you, in your thesis, started the discussion to build marine design, ship design foundation model? Do you start the discussion? Yes, yes. yes. I would say like, yes, like in terms of providing or proving the feasibility or usability of such approaches yep. for an industry, which is already lagging behind compared to others, I think we have done a very good job and then providing a very realistic and realistic look on the feasibility and usability of these models into, into ship design. As I said, like their integration and adoptability in the industry would be need some further development and encouragement by, by the industry. And I'm, I'm happy to actually to be saying that like the marine industry currently is, is an amazing place to be. Mm -hmm. Although that was the adopting the new technology into this industry was, I would say with my very limited knowledge, that was driven by strict regulation by International Maritime Organization. But right now, I feel like there is a, a hunger from this industry in really getting some novel technologies on board. Currently, as I said, like this is done for to make the existing vessel efficient, but in the future, as we will be building new ships, the customers, the industry will be looking forward to such approaches. Shah, thank you very much for your insight into your work, the marine industry, and all the best for you, your company, and greetings to London. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin.